and, and Lim. Um, okay, so the first um, the first uh, item is the open forum. Uh, this is for sort of any questions that have been received by members of the public, um, either prior to the meeting or um, anything that people want to raise now that's not on the wider agenda. Um, I have had one um, email through um, from somebody who wanted to ask a question who can't, who can't attend, which I'm happy to read read out. Um, is there any other questions as well at this point? If you indicate, I'll, I will um, go through the question that we had. Um, and then um, any other people can can, can ask as well. Um, so let me just find the question that was asked um, so we can read it out. Yeah, so we had a question from Jean, um, Jean from um, Slowit, um, and this was her, her question. Um, back in June, 2021, there was a four week road closure for resurfacing in the hilltop part of Slowit. Hilltop has a lot of residents, many of whom regularly use the 181 bus route run by first. Hilltop, as its name suggests, is high um, high up above the center of Slowit with shops, chemists, hairdressers, etc. I knew beforehand that this would cause problems for many elderly residents, people with mobility difficulties, and also people who would walk down uh, but would need transport back up the hill and not everyone can afford frequent taxis. I contacted first to ask if they had any other smaller buses available, and if so, could they use another route, for example, Bankgate, which is steep and goes under a railway bridge. They replied to say that they don't have any smaller buses and that Bankgate is not a permitted route for them because of the railway bridge. I contacted staff at Wyker for suggestions and alternatives, and after some discussion, the access bus seemed to be the only option. A local organisation that supports people in the community called Cooperative Carecombe Valley got involved. We made links with some of the local residents and eventually were able to um, organise just one bus trip with access during the last week of the closure. The access bus is very heavily used and a number of the journeys were limited because of the pandemic. I spoke to the group on the day and one person asked me why haven't they done anything like this before? Um, my sad reply was there isn't a they. So on the back of that um, story a question was was to share two questions said could more be done to help people during periods of road closures and are there any plans for more access buses um so so that was a question i don't know whether anyone can help to answer that i i, I guess first from a in that scenario where we do have road closures what kind of consideration is given to those bus routes and our alternate routes looked at i don't know if that can be can be answered I know in the in the um, question it was a first bus, so I don't I don't know if you can answer whether what happens in those scenarios are you alerted to those closures and do you look to make any? Amendments? Yeah, yeah, we, we we are alerted and um, where we can we will. But like like it was said in there was the low bridge and there was only the small minibuses that could have been used and like we, we just don't have any. Um, so it'd have to be contracted, I believe, contracted out contracted out by a wicker to another operator or somebody who does have smaller buses. We, we would look at alternatives. So in a scenario where there wasn't obviously restrictions, would you look to um, potentially we, alternate routes would be them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd look, at, we'd, we'd look at rerouting yeah. for, the, for the duration of the closure or whatever it was. Okay. That is it. I, I think from a Martin, you, do you want to say something, Councillor Bob? Uh, well, just picking up on that, I mean, and it's something which is we need to have a a finger on going forward, James, because obviously we're going to have uh, Transpennine route upgrade, potentially more works at Cooper Bridge, etc. Um, A629 Edgerton. So there's going to be various schemes coming in, but the the, the comment from the operator that um, you know, it's for Wicker to make sure that their business continues if they don't have, if I was running a business or when I ran a business, if I couldn't deliver my business, like if my car broke down, I didn't turn around and say it was up to somebody else to get me uh, a car or a van. I hired one to continue my business. If bus operators find an impediment, such as a low bridge due to a temporary thing, 
then it's up to them to hire in to continue to serve their customers. It's not up to Wicca to step in. Otherwise, Chair, and this is playing into the, uh, the narrative that's going, we find ourselves uh, in full agreement with the mayor that's saying, if the operators can't run a bus service, then maybe public uh, service should take it over. Thanks, Martin. Dwayne, I can see you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, just to just to come in on on that point, as as Martin will know, we've got a um, quite a substantial um, diversion around Cooper Bridge Roadworks at the moment, um, and that's putting it um, politely. Um, <laughs> there is a um, a considerable amount of work that my team get involved in um, from from Arriva's point of view, and no doubt Transdev and First also have the same process, um, where where we do get presented with roadworks, and there are a lot around the district. We do an assessment as to the suitability of alternative routes. Um, we have another one in, in Emily at the moment, which is causing quite a um, quite a lengthy diversion for us around uh, uh, around Flockton. Um, and it, in those sorts of instances, we've got to take a real balance between the extent of the diversion as to um, as to the alternative routes and the added journey time, the impact on punctuality, the additional resource that has to go into it. Um, and I think it's a it's a collaborative approach. Um, so whilst I completely take your point, um, Martin, as to um, it's our business, they're our customers, and, and we of course will do what we can to to try and mitigate any any roadworks or, or or issue as you've, as you've seen on the network. Um, it's a collaborative approach that we we go through with the combined authority. So where there are other operators out there that do have smaller vehicles and, and can assist where. There are um, there are particular areas of concern and particular areas that, that, that wouldn't be served. We do work with the command authority quite closely, and we do um, and we do ensure that where possible, we do have those solutions in place. Thanks. Yeah. Th thanks for the answer. I, I, th I think um, what would be helpful. So, so Mark, I appreciate and, and, and James I appreciate this. That you might not have seen this question. Um, I, I know that um, Dominic from the. The, the governance team is is going to respond actually to, to the resident uh, directly and has been in conversation with it which is which is fine but i think it would be helpful for us just to have a look at what happened in this scenario what discussions were had before just to see if we can learn anything from it because i think it sounds to me like there were op alternatives that potentially could have been found um but wasn't done proactively um so i think it would be helpful if we could look into that and, and yeah. just take some learning from that and, and that. feedback where possible to operator and obviously to, to the, the resident who's raised the question. Yeah, no, thank you, Councillor Armwood. Yeah, I've done that actually. I've asked our, our mobility team to look at, at, at what happened there. I mean, we do pu publish weekly roadworks impacts um, and on larger schemes such as Cooper Bridge, we will have dis bus disruption plans, but we do do our best. I suspect mm -hmm. this one has probably fallen under the radar because it's it's not a huge one, but it's not small. Um, yeah. And I think we probably just need to be a little bit smarter on, on those sorts of things. Absolutely. Um, but yeah. We will, yeah, we'll get a response back. Um, do you want me to cover the second part about access bus? Yeah, that would be helpful, please. Yeah. Um, so we have 33 access buses um, um, and we're constantly reviewing the usage and the usage is, it's been really important during COVID. It's been a, it's been a really important um, element of works, even with reduced capacity. Um, so hopefully the capacity will increase as we come out of that. Um, and we are actually looking to renew that fleet um, because they are becoming a little bit older now. Um, so again, I will ask the question um, as part of that renewal, is there, is there, uh, is there a requirement there or a, um, the poss possibility of increasing that fleet? Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it sounds like a reasonable solution in this instance and maybe we could have picked it up a little bit sooner. Yeah, no, that, that's helpful. I think in this case, I mean, I don't know the, the area really well, but I, I think um, the, what we've got to bear in mind is that obviously some of those harder to reach areas, there's not going to be alternative travel measures. So ironically, you know, in some places where there is disruption, the, the large services, there might be other options that people can take as well. But but here, th th there isn't going to be any alternative for those those residents. And if it's for a long time, that's going to be difficult. So, OK, if we can, if we can get that information and, and respond to Jean, uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. Um, any other questions on this section on the open forum? Bearing in mind that we do have obviously the information report and um, operator section of the of the agenda, so we can cover more detail on on, on some of those areas as well. Um, yeah, Councillor Bolt. 
Yeah, thanks, James. Um, I had a question from um, a colleague at council last week about communication for this meeting. Um, it was said that elected members in Kirklees weren't getting notice of this meeting. So I don't know if, if James or other officers can address that. You know, do we routinely send out to all elected members in a council when we have uh, a consultation meeting? Yeah. Um, well, I can answer the question. I, I I'm, I'm appreciate you asking the question. I, I assume you've seen the response that, that came back on on it. Um, but I think I think the answer to the question is you've not seen it. No, I don't think so, James. No. Okay. I've been a bit busy with Cooper Bridge this week. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. You have got a response on it, but I'll, I'll give you the flavour of okay. what the response is. And it's helpful, I guess, because people can then hear it anyway. Um, I think the flavour of it is that we don't we don't routinely um, invite members, all members from a particular authority to these these committees as a, as an invitation because of the constitution, the constitution, the way that it's made up of obviously transport committee members and then public representatives. Um, there's no reason, obviously, why members can't join this meeting if that's required. And as the chair, I'm more than happy to um, facilitate those people to ask a question or to, to contribute where they, there's something that they want to raise. But I think the um, main thrust is that we don't want to turn this into just an elected members meeting because those members get an opportunity to ask questions at council, access to, to, through other, other forms of... Um, through WICA or through, through local councils as well. So I don't want to just turn it into a meeting of the council. And I think if we send invites to everybody, that may be the implication that this is a meeting you should be coming to attending and contributing to. But I think if members want to um, want to come um, and observe and ask a question where relevant, that's, um, that's fine. Uh, so I don't think we'll be sending invites out to everybody uh, but more, you know, it's not that difficult to find out when the the meetings are and <laughs> etc. If you're if you're inclined to want to come, so I think that's the answer to that to that one. Yeah, um, chair, if I can just add a bit onto that as well, um, Councillor Ball, in the um, reply as well, it also notes that there will be physical meetings in the future. Obviously, it's a bit working out uh, at present, and then it just becomes um, a, a, a case of physical space because. Obviously, if we invite so many people, we'd have to rent out an auditorium. <laughs> so uh, that can be that can be an issue as well. But the uh, full reply has been sent um, last week. And if you have any further questions, if you direct them to me, I will satisfy those for you. Thanks, James. OK, um, we'll move on to the main um, main part of the agenda then. So apologies for absence. I've had we've had apologies from Councillor Kaushik and Councillor Firth. I don't think we've had any other formal apologies. Um, no chance. Anybody does. Okay, it's fine. Um, declarations of interests. Uh, I don't have anything to declare. I don't know if Martin, you do, but no, no. Okay, that's fine. Um, exemption of of the public. I don't. I, I don't think there's any uh, reports here that we need to have in private session. So that's that's fine. Um, so just moving on to the minutes of the meeting on the 24th of March, I think theoretically, because we're not meeting in person, we can't actually formally approve them. So they're just more for information and comment. Um, does anybody have anything to raise on those? If not, well, great, yep. we'll move on. Similarly for the minutes of the um, joint meeting that was held on the 26th of August. Again, they're just for information. So if anyone's got any comments, can take those, but otherwise... Um, nothing to, 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 to do on those ones. Okay. Okay, so item seven says introductions. Um, so I suppose probably not everybody <laughs> necessarily does know everybody, I suppose. I suppose that's true. Um, so J James, I know obviously Graham Michael John's got to go before three. Could I propose yeah. that if people want to speak, or they, if necessary, they introduce themselves when they speak and then we can say, save that going around the room. Yeah, so I agree. Time. I agree. Yeah, we, we, we do spend a lot of time going around virtual rooms, don't we? Um, so I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, I think when we get to the operator updates, people will introduce themselves anyway. Um, and I think the public representatives we, we've been on for a while, so we'll know <laughs> know each other. So that's all. That's all. Well, okay. Um, chairs update. Um, I don't have a massive amount to say. The, the only thing I was just going to update on was just um, an update I had um, earlier this week, um, just about the two hundred five uh, bus service. Um, 
So uh, this is a service which runs uh, between Dewsbury and Pudsey um, and Reva had given notice to cease the operation uh, of the service. Um, so there were some concerns uh, with this because of some of the communities that were, were served by this service uh, that wouldn't have had, had access to other services and been able to get, you know, um, get to so Dewsbury, Dewsbury and Pudsey in each direction. Um, so WICA have been looking at this um, and to look to make alternative arrangements um, and have um, agreed to, um, to, to, to basically uh, replace the service from the 25th um, of October uh, following um, procurement process. It's a, a, a company called TLC Travel Limited that are taking forward that contract um, and will be providing that service um, and they've listed that the, let's see where it says it, the cost to the combined authority, this is around 120k per annum. Um, and they're just in the, in the process of um, recruiting the staff that are needed for that service. So I don't know what that means in terms of, uh, or it says here it will be a reduced, reduced timetable initially before it moves to full, to a full service. So I thought it was just important to update people on that um, that that thing that happened um, that announcement that had been made this this week on that, which hopefully will be be useful to people using that that service. Um, but I think that's the only um, update I had to make, um, to be honest. So, anybody got any questions on that? Or happy to move to the next next item? Yeah, we'll move on then to the information report. Um, Mark, is that you that's going to talk through that? Can't quite hear you. <laughs> Apologies. Is it possible to share that, James, so I can just talk through it, please, because I've got several screens open, and that's not one of them. <laughs> uh, yes, one second, I will ask. Um, sorry, asking if you can't share it, if we can get. Um, ben to share it for us. Yeah, it's just the to... it's just the information report, so I can just talk through the. It's if on it's the... possible, yeah, if it's possible for Ben to do that, would be helpful because I've got about minutes. five screens open and I can't work out which. Preparing the I've prepped for the presentation, not for the not for the minutes, unfortunately. One second, and we'll we'll bring that up for us. Brilliant, thank you. Um, yeah. There we go. Okay, if you could just slide down to the table, please. I think that's probably the easiest. Oh, oh. sorry, it was the appendix report that's referred to. That was after. Super, thank you. Um, so there's some ongoing works to, uh, to start with. Obviously, there's been discussions for quite some time now on um, Combi on, on getting a regional urban traffic control uh, centre. Uh, that word, um, work is still ongoing uh, and it's now look, due to complete in March next year. Uh, so that's a little bit of work. It's been going on for some time now. It's uh, it's finding the right spot, I think, is the is the complex bit, but I think we're, we're making some progress on that now and doing it via a cloud service rather than uh, a single building, shall we say. Um, as you can see there, the ULEV taxi scheme with lots of um, charging points going in now, we're up to 88 uh, and that's now complete. Uh, as far as I'm aware, we have some um, all around the district. You can see them in public car parks, you can see them at supermarkets, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Crosschurch Street, um, feedback obviously on using Crosschurch Street, this is in Huddersfield Town Centre for those that don't know it, um, but we're hoping to have resolved the issues that we've got on, on uh, from a pedestrian perspective and a cycle perspective and a retail perspective, and that's due on site in 2022 again. Um, I won't, there's, there's pretty much not the same on... Um, on the Bradley Brighouse City Connect scheme and the Huddersfield Narrow Canal scheme, uh, the A62 improvement scheme. That it, uh, um, I think that's all. That's commenced. The first phases of that commenced. 
at Cooper Bridge. We know there's a, lot, a number of issues there being addressed. Uh, it's quite complex. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, and hopefully things will, will start to settle down as, they, as we move on. Um, Dewsbury Bus Station, this is part of the Transforming Cities project, um, which is a major refurbishment to uh, Dewsbury Bus Station. Um, that is ongoing. Um, the concept designs come together with, there's a public consultation exercise being undertaken, and we're just feeding the findings from the consultation exercise into the designs. Um, and that is, uh, that is moving forward with a, with a hopeful start in 2022 and construction to, through 23, 2023 into 24. Very similar story with Huddersfield bus station. Um, similarly, that's a re major refurbishment uh, and improvements to the to the bus station as a whole, plus some external works which are under being taken by uh, Kirklees. Uh, again, public consultation has been undertaken on that. Uh, some positive feedback, and that's been put into the concept designs and following a very similar path to Dewsbury because that's part of the funding cycle. Um, the A62 Smart Corridor, well, that's, that's pretty much as it says there, due to start on site uh, any time now um, with a with, uh, with a two year scheme. Uh, and I'm not sure about the Huddersfield Southern Corridors. I'd need to get an update on that. So if there's any specific questions, um, I'm happy to pick those up with the local highways authority and pass those on, unless we've got someone from the local highways authority that could maybe give us an update on those. Yeah, I don't think we do, but just to, just to clarify a couple of points, I think, uh, sorry, I'll bring you in a second, mm -hmm. Martin. I think... Um, yeah just to stay on the a62 um i think there's so there's there's there's, there's some there is some resurfacing going on at the moment mm -hmm. um but that's obviously separate to the the scheme that's been oh, right. okay. referred to here um which has been going for our online um outline business case and uh certainly yeah martin and i are fully <laughs> up to speed up to speed on, on that one um and i just wanted to add on the Jewsbury bus station i know i mentioned to you mark uh, before the meeting um, it's been raised before through here and um, at, at, at um, Kirklees just around the, the closure of the customer service centre and, and, and how, how that's going to be um, replaced in some way at Dewsbury. I think from what you'd said in that consultation, that's come out strongly as well. So I it think has, it's just yeah. to note here that that's um, something important that in terms of feedback we're getting from users about the importance of that. Um, I know we're looking at solutions to it, so I just yeah. wanted to, to, to mention that. Um, Councillor Bolt? Yeah, thanks, James. Um, is it, well, it's more than a shame. I think yeah, we should put in a comment that Kirklees haven't sent anybody. If WICA officers are passing responsibility for answering questions back to Kirklees officers, then it's incumbent on Kirklees. It's not much of a consultation meeting if they're not here to, to respond to, be, to questions. Some of the things, I mean, I was trying to think, Mark, on that, um, just trying to find on Google, Cross Church Street at Huddersfield. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure I've cycled on there um, already. You can cycle on there, yeah. I think it's an improvement, Councillor Bolt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you come come off Queen Street. There's a You do, for opposite the university, and then cycle yeah, across the down top the, of the King's Gate Centre. The theatre. Yeah, there's uh, there's a cycle there, there is a cycle lane on there which mm -hmm. uh, on Google somebody's parking in it, um, and then then yeah it's a one way street, so unless the proposal is to have a two way system, uh, Cross Church Street already has um, a mandatory cycle lane down the left hand side of it. Uh, not sure what they what the um, measures were on there. No, I'm, I'm sorry. That's that's. What I was hoping there might be a highways representative. Could you, could I am the, aware of that. I've cycled on it myself. Could James put the table back up because there are a couple of points, a uh, couple yeah. of schemes I just wanted to question on. Mm -hmm. If James Young could put the table back up. Yeah, I'll get that for you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and scroll back up. There was. Um, there we go. Um, Bradley to Brighouse. Mm -hmm. The few issues here that need clarity uh, because obviously uh, there's issues and as chair will know of uh, land acquisition and things um, I've got great concerns that there's no integration between this scheme and the 70 million pound Cooper Bridge bypass when I've raised that with Kirkley's officers they say that 
although the most direct route to the Bradley Brighouse scheme coming from North Kirklees is down Lower Quarry Road, that's not where they intend the road to go, the route to go. Um, that I would suggest is in direct conflict with the key design principles for cycling infrastructure as laid out in the government's gear change document, which says routes and schemes which take account of, of how users actually behave. And a question that I've asked, and I've asked WICAR officers, one of the key design principles is routes should be designed only by those who've experienced the road on a cycle. So when we're putting these things forward and WICAR are putting their, their banners on them, have any of the uh, project engineers been out and cycled it? Because, as I say, trying to get across even now before we widen it and change it, the A62 to any of the homes, businesses or anything else, there's no facilities there. Um, the, the problem that we've got on Bradley to Brighouse and Huddersfield Narrow is, again, a conflict with the key design principles. Cyclists must be treated as vehicles, not pedestrians. When we go onto anything involving Canal and Rivers Trust, they, um, they instigate measures such as airframe barriers and things like that, which are prohibitive. And um, you know, we've raised this before at WICA when, um, when a councillor myself went out. Routes must join together. Um, barriers such as chicanes and that should be avoided. And again, routes must feel directive, logically and intuitively understood. None of these principles um, I can see on a lot of schemes that are going through, and particularly, as I say, working with CRT. And I think both the Combined Authority and Kirklees need to be fully aware that government ministers have said where schemes do not conform to LTN 120, gear change and everything else, not mm. only will the funding for those be stopped, but they may lose future funding. So, yeah, we need to, if we're producing transport schemes, they need to be suitable for transport. We're not going to, I would say, we shouldn't be funding Canal and Rivers Trust leisure facilities and propping their budgets up. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Martin. Um, Sean, did, did you have your hand up? I think you might have put it down, but I'll just check. Yes, I did, yes. Um, I want to talk about the Cooper Bridge scheme, but not from the normal what's been discussed so far. Mm -hmm. It's about the fact that they, they, they actively boast in the report that there's no bus priority measures in this scheme because we can't fit them in. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm wondering, surely the command authority won't be funding this scheme from that, because you know, nationally and locally, bus priority and active travel is a king, not, but not cars. And that's, and, and, and Martin can comment, but, better than me but the, the, the reading the report cy the cycling has been massively panned as being not good enough if you look at the scheme it's a lot of it's a lot of shared pavements with cyclists that's their idea of active travel and they actually boast in the report that there's no no provision here for buses they couldn't fit them in and as the, as the, the, the when they gave the presentations to councillors the guy said we only can fit active travel in where we can and I wondered if this scheme yeah. really still will qualify for funding from the command authority. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. I suppose difficult to, to, to comment on, on, on that decision of the, the funding from, from the authority. But um, yeah, I, I think the points you raised are fair about, um, you know, the use of uh, sort of bus priority particularly. Um, can I j just on um, Councillor Bolt Bolt's point about... Um, people um from from um Kirklees highways joining um could we just take an action there just to check who, who we invite there because i think we used to invite tim uh lawrence. lawrence last time i'm not sure he's in that role anymore so I... yeah, he's gone he's gone across to wiker james yeah so he's <laughs> he, so i don't it's whether anybody got get is getting that invitation um or, or the right person's getting that so that we can make sure that we have you know their opportunity then they can respond to those comments that Sean's made as well because uh, um, there isn't anybody obviously to, to really give that level of detail on that I'll um, follow that up Chair. I'll follow the membership from Cardclays up yeah thank you very much um, okay does anybody have any Sorry. other comments to make on this no, just to, on the back of Sean I mean again it is quite Sean's comment there is something again that I, I've raised <laughs> um, the, the suggestion Sean on uh, on, on the new Cooper Bridge 70 million scheme 
is that there'll be some kind of a transponder so that when the bus gets to the front of the queue, it gets priority. But I okay. would suggest by the time the bus gets to the front of the queue, it's already got priority. Um, and yeah. Particularly yeah. if we're, I mean, the, uh, the stadium um, and the Huddersfield Town uh, fans are looking at a sustainable stadium project. And I've suggested to them, and they've got it in as probably their fifth priority, that um, travel is included. Now, one of the things that we want to be looking at is to getting fans out of the cars onto buses to go to home games. They do it when they're going away. But in order to do that, they don't want to be experiencing the, the situation that I had when I, I took my son to watch a match out a while ago, caught a bus in and it was no problem. When we finished the match and came out, the traffic was nose to tail down Leeds Road. So we said, oh, we'll set off and walk and because we'd bought return tickets and we'll, we'll get on the bus when it comes. We'd got back to Cooper Bridge before the traffic eased and there was any sign of a bus. And by that time, he'd had enough walking and demanded that I took him into Miller and Carter for dinner. So it was the most expensive non-bus journey I've ever had. But you know, we need to be uh, actively serious about bus priority. Um, I think, and again, because there's nobody here that can't comment, I think, Sean, it's actually worse than non-provision. From my recollection of the future Cooper Bridge scheme, they're taking out a bus lane on Leeds Road as you come down from Robertstown and Murfield towards what Miller and Carter, Three Nuns Junction. They, the bus lane that's there now will be removed. So not only uh, are they not providing it, they're taking it out. But, and I think it's a valid point that the combined authority as funder and as a key partner and as it's the mayoral ambition to prioritise buses should be represented at these meetings and not just agreeing with Gerkley's, but where necessarily, you know, give them a slap on the wrist and tell them to bring, come in, um, because when we look at carbon targets later, obviously modal shift is a key uh, impact on the carbon targets. And if we're not getting people alternatives, they're not going to get out of the cars, are they? Yeah. Yeah, Sean, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was going to, come back on a little bit I agree with everything yeah agree with that um it's just that there's a, the lack not just bus pri not just traffic lights because there's already one on leeds road the priority traffic light i think it's the only one i've seen in kirklees mm. and you and even there the bus has to come to a stop while the lights change and allow the traffic <laughs> to stop before they then let through in just ahead no just 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 after the traffic's gone through that those yeah. those priority those priority traffic lights start to change and the bus the bus has stopped already and they, that has to carry on and take second place really and it's just a lack of bus lanes and things like that that's in there i just i just think it's just a bit, it, and the fact they're taking things out is just not good and yeah, that's near the famous oak road is that one james <laughs> yes i'm aware of that one. <laughs> um, okay Th thank thanks for those uh, contributions i think as a um good discussion discussion on that to be fair um okay any other comments on the information report or are we happy to move on to the to the operator updates okay we'll, we'll, we shall move on um graham if, as you've indicated you need you need to leave do you want to to go first on this this section uh, yes that's fine thank you chair um uh, good afternoon everyone i apologize for need to uh, leave early in two meetings um so i never never idea so appreciate that um, I, normally, when I when I speak, sometimes you go before or after Pete. Uh, Pete normally says why, so it's sort of duplication with Norv, and then I do apologise. Um, but we, we always start on performance, and performance um, is actually in actually quite a reasonable place at the moment um, on different parts of the network. If you look at our sort of national performance, uh, we're in the, the 90s consistently. And have been for a, a period now, uh, but the, the real focus of attention is making sure we can go through the critical autumn period, uh, working with Network Rail and other operators to manage performance um, when the network can be at its worst in, in terms of days um, and, and seeing how we go through. What is key for that is the element of services that are being brought back in, but also making sure that we don't lose the performance gains that we've uh, carried through. Um, since the, the beginning of the COVID-19 um, impact on the railway and services we provide. So there is close monitoring across the industry, particularly key um, interchange uh, areas of delay, such as leads and um, junctions onto the, the main East Coast mainland, for example, at the general route heading towards Huddersfield and Manchester to make sure that any known delays or new sort of sources of um, uh, 
recurring delay uh, are actually examined further uh, and then worked through as an industry uh, to find the regs uh, going forward. So uh, performance good, but not complacent. Um, but equally, our new national rail contract has a range of uh, new measures uh, where we do monitor performance uh, a lot more closely than the previous contract in the old franchise had and was effectively within 10 minutes of arrival at the end destination. We've now got three core performance um, indicators. One is uh, on time, the other one is within three minutes, and the other one is within 15 minutes. That's not end destination, that's each calling point uh, along the journey uh, on the entire line of route. Uh, so that feeds into the higher degree of performance analysis, which is ongoing between ourselves, other operators in the network rail, which is the, the right thing to do under the new national rail contract. Um, if we then move forward to just have a spot check on demand, we are around about 70% of where we were in terms of number of customers uh, in the pre-COVID level. Um, that's uh, a figure which we can take at face value, but clearly there are some services that will be higher than that and some services that will be lower. In fact, we do have some services that are operating above pre-COVID levels, uh, and they are predominantly operating over the weekend because what we are seeing is a uh, leisure-based recovery, uh, largely, where a lot of the travel is happening uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and into Monday, whereas the traditional commuting pattern um, is lighter than it was before. But also during the week, we have people who are heading into towns and cities, uh, meeting people uh, for, for other leisure activities, shopping and whatnot. Um, and there are a lot of people coming back in the traditional evening peak as well. So the numbers are, are, are growing in terms of patronage coming back, uh, but the, the trends are there are clear bespoke areas where if it's led by leisure, you do have heavier demand, particularly the weekend. We're looking at this closely with um, the Rail North Partnership, uh, who manage the franchise on behalf of Transport for the North, uh, sorry, manage the business on behalf of Transport for the North and the Department for Transport. And we're looking at where it might be logical to maybe change some of the timetabling so there can be additional resource or at the weekend, for example, to accommodate additional demands. So that work is ongoing uh, as we move forward. Um, but uh, it's definitely encouraging to see the numbers coming back. Uh, and I've been in Leeds uh, myself a couple of times at the weekend and seen the volumes coming off trains and also on trains heading in different directions, which is encouraging to see. And I think probably the last point I'll make here is just regarding investment that we've been putting into Jews Bay Station. Um, some of the, the attendees might be aware that we had funding um, from uh, Transpan Express, but also funding from Kirklees and West Yorkshire Combined Authority through the Transforming Cities Fund to improve uh, facilities at Dewsbury Station. So a, an additional shelter has now been installed on the towards the lead, lead side of the station and the uh, toilets have been installed on the Huddersfield side bound off the uh, side of the station. Um, they will be opened probably in the next few weeks. Uh, just some snagging issues to be resolved. Uh, but there's a male and female facility, but also a changing places facility as well. I know it's been a long, long ask for aspiration or, or just ask for that station. So it's, it's good news that that's actually been provided um, back to the customer benefit yet. Um, obviously happy to take any questions. I hope that's a good quick run through of where we are. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Um, just while you're here, can I just check when the only thing I, I wanted to understand is when we're talking about obviously 70% of capacity, and I know you've obviously mentioned about weekends. For example, if you're commuting between Huddersfield and Leeds or Dewsbury and Leeds, um, you know, whenever I did that pre, pre pandemic, the trains were well, well over capacity in terms of actually people being able to, well, not even just get a seat, but being able to stand comfortably sometimes on those trains. So, even if we're at say 70% capacity, what does that mean in terms of the actual experience for the user? Are, are, the, are those trains still, um, you know, full to capacity, if you see what I mean? Uh, thank you, Sheer. What um, you've actually reminded me that I didn't uh, add in is that whilst the COVID period has been um, with us, we've 
completed the programme to introduce all of our new trains. So all of the uh, various Nova fleet that we had, they've all been introduced um, and obviously new trains bring an additional capacity as well. So anybody who hasn't travelled on the network during COVID um, since it started will find it's a different product because all of the trains are there, additional capacity. When we're talking about um, comparing 70% with where we were pre-COVID, that's the number of passenger journeys which we have in our network. Um, so there is um, uh, additional seats on the network, but also there are trains which are just given by the time of when they're operating in the day, predominant at the weekend, everybody wants to travel at some time. So there are busy trains out there on the network, but there are also substantially more seats provided on the network than, than there was uh, in the, in the pre-COVID era that we were in. Okay, thanks. Um, just had a question in the chat from... Um, David, just to say, is there an accessible toilet at Dewsbury Station? Do you know the answer? Uh, I believe that is part of the, uh, the, the unit of the block that has been installed, yes. Has, okay, that's great. Um, okay, we'll, 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 we'll move on. We'll have the opportunity to, to ask questions as well at the end of this. Appreciate, Graham, you might have left at that point. But um, if we move, Pete, do you want to, to go next? Uh, gladly, uh, gladly. And as, as Graham says, we, we as we've we share much of the same geography, so much of this report will be similar. Our performance is 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 equally uh, good. Uh, we're running. We we call we call it a time to three is how we measure things, which is every station within three minutes of a scheduled time, and we're running about eighty eight percent currently, just before the autumn happens, and um, the old measure of of, of PPM, which was five minutes at the end of the journey, uh, that would that would have been in the high 90s. So it, it's a good report and it, it's good performance. But of course, it's on the back of fewer people traveling and slightly fewer train services. So uh, uh, that's important to note. But I do uh, reiterate what Graham says, what some of the work that has gone on during COVID with both our people and network rails people to to really focus on performance really seems to be bearing fruit. So that is is good news. Customer numbers for us, uh, we're in the high seventies overall. If we take an overall figure, seventy uh, percent of what it was two years ago, ostensibly that means. Uh, but as with Graham, that hides a multitude of nuances, not least uh, the leisure travel this summer and well into the winter, uh, well into the autumn now, is much, much stronger than we would have seen before. And some of those figures are well over 100%, if you just take them on leisure alone. Our commute figures, though, uh, are not what they were. And we're, uh, we're, about, we're about a third, just over a third of, of what we would have seen uh, in the commutes uh, pre-COVID. How has COVID affected us? Well, um, in two ways, really, and that is the reason you're not seeing the, the timetables uh, that we, we had prior to, um, prior to the pandemic. First one is, is we've had to introduce some uh, allowances into our rosters to enable uh, to stop bunching as people book on duty, uh, so they aren't booking on duty at the same time. That's not a massive issue, but it has robbed us of a certain amount of flexibility. But our main issue has been driver training. Northern as an operator is, is very much a nursery operator, and we train a great number of, of, of people to be trained drivers. And some of that, that starts in the classroom, and obviously we can socially isolate in the classroom and did do very quickly. But uh, there comes a point in any driver's training when they've physically got a driver train, of course. We tend not to just let them do that on their own. So getting people... Um, getting people to socially isolate in the driving cab is impossible. They're just not big enough. So we had about an eight month hiatus in uh, driver training, actually near a nine months in driver training, but at the turn of the year, some terrific work by our safety people and indeed the trades unions brought about a, a method of working, uh, which was deemed safe and was proved to be safe, uh, but involved a great deal of, of testing and, and training bubbles, uh, creating but that really helped things and all our new trains as as with graham are here and operating which is great news 
but we have this huge training piece with those as much as anything else. Well, that's been uh, that's been sorted over the period, and now all, all our people are qualified to drive our new trains, but we have other training to do as well. That got a lot easier recently as the COVID restrictions uh, lifted, but there's still a lot of training to do, and that will be with us as an issue right the way through until the spring next year. Uh, so that that is something we're looking at, but uh, we've also increased our cleaning, and that will stay with us. So uh, train cleaning has has got a lot better um, through necessity initially, but also through will as well. And uh, we we use fogging products to ensure that trains remain hygienic, but also uh, we have more people physically out there doing uh, doing the cleaning basically. And that will stay with us. Those people will stay with us uh, through into a post-pandemic world. The, the fuel crisis we, we heard of a couple of weeks ago, I've mentioned the others, so I'll mention it here. It wasn't an issue for Northern. We do use a lot of diesel, uh, traction diesel, but that is delivered to our big depots by rail. Uh, and those where it is, we do use road transport to deliver it. There, it's, it's delivered by a separate factor and it hasn't proven an issue. But initially, uh, certainly during the, the problems, some of our contractors, such as the station cleaners, were finding it difficult to get diesel and, and station cleaning certainly suffered for a very short period. But that thankfully seems to be behind us now and there are no reports of problems uh, obtaining fuel. Um, good news at Neville Hill, the big depot to the east of Leeds. This depot was part operated by Northern, part operated by East Midlands Railway. That has now all come under Northern. In fact, it happened from this, uh, this Monday. And that gives us some really powerful opportunities to improve train service. Because it's such a big depot and it's so important to West Yorkshire. You know, we always say that if... If Neville Hill sneezes, uh, the train service in West Yorkshire catches a cold, and that is certainly true, and has always been the case. So um, we really look forward to working with the combined authority and, and our other stakeholders to make Neville Hill a success going forward. Next timetable change is December 21. Uh, in in Kirklees, no, diff- no changes really to the pattern we see now. West Yorkshire as a whole, we will see... Um, we will see more trains on the Halifax to um, Hull service. It's currently two hourly. It goes back to hourly. And the line out through um, through Leeds Northwest out to Morecambe uh, returns to its full service this winter. So that's uh, that's good news. But there's still there's still more to do. Uh, a lot of marketing going on, not least uh, to the commuters, people we would never have marketed to in the past because, frankly, uh, we didn't need to. We're absolutely doing that now. And, and lots of new products out there, including the flexible season ticket, which is a, a carnet of journeys to enable people to who maybe aren't working uh, as, a, as a used to you know, uh, five days a week in the office to enable them to sort of get benefit of discounts and travel less frequently. Other than that, Chair, I think that's all I have to say. Happy to take questions. Thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, do we want to, to, to move to um, Sean for an update? Oh, and then we can obviously... J- sorry, can I just yeah, chip in on Northern, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks. Sorry, we're looking for the the hand button comes to come see it. Uh, firstly, can I thank Pete for his support? There was a, an issue where some of the Murfield in Bloom team had raised a concern. They'd been told that um, their hardworking uh, plants and that were going to be shifted and Pete quickly facilitated a meeting and the, the volunteers are a lot happier. But also just for, for the meeting to note that Murfield Railway Station uh, was successful um, in receiving awards during the uh, Britain in Bloom judging in Yorkshire. Um, they got a Neighbourhood Digital Award for Excellence in Gardening in Community Environment and a Neighbourhood Digital Award for Achievement from the RHS. And I note with some amusement that the president of the Royal Horticultural Society is a Mr Keith Weed, 
that was a very <laughs> appropriate name for somebody involved in gardening. But uh, that's a project which was fully supported by Norden. And I'm sure Pete will take our thanks back to everybody involved. Of course I will. And, and well deserved, uh, as we have so much of this. These groups in Northern, it really is what makes Northern Northern, if I'm honest. Uh, and it's terrific to see. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll bring in, Sean, do you want to come in from a Grand Central perspective? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I, I guess very, very similar to what Pete um, and um, Graham have reported in, in terms of increase in passenger numbers. I mean, but just taking a, a small sort of step back from 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 that for for a second, I, I guess Grand Central the the impact in COVID was like another a number of commercial sort of businesses um, across across the UK suffered significantly, and I guess that that um, problem statement um, meant that our business had to go into a, a so called hibernation for for three periods. Um, and I guess, you know, the turn of the year um, saw a change there, and that was in line with the, the government sort of measures and relaxation of the the measures they put in place. That gives an opportunity to come back and start to serve our communities um, earlier this year um, on a, I guess, a ramped up um, train service proposition. Um, we had to do that um, because the demand clearly wasn't there at that point. One of the biggest constraints we had was, was social distancing, of course, but there was a general lack of confidence um, and that brought uh, about a lack of demand. Um, during that early sort of period, we were um, running at obviously a loss. We made significant losses last year. Um, so we had to be really careful that we could manage that cost base, but service that demand that was starting to exist with the relaxation. I guess from stage four onwards, that allowed us to ramp up further. Um, and, you know, I'm pleased to sort of say that we're back on sort of full service position for, for serving Murfield as it stands. Um, in terms of passenger numbers, very, very similar um, story to what Graham, like I said, and, and uh, Pete has, has mentioned, um, we're probably about 65% on 2019 figures. Um, 2020 for us is a, a complete washout and it's not a good metric to measure against. Um, I, I guess we're suffering very, very similar at weekends where we are oversubscribed and that's causing us quite a few capacity issues. Um, it's a difficult one to deal with. Um, we are a small operator. We have a small number of trains, um, but we've got to try and look at how we can strengthen and serve, serve these customers, particularly weekends. Sunday seems to be the pinch point on both our routes, both our North Leaf services and our West Riding service. So I guess a little bit of good news but against the backdrop of where our business was you know seriously at risk we've had to make quite a few organizational changes um, to get our costs under control our supply network have been very very helpful in that sort of journey to, to manage costs and for us now it's 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 not survival now um, it's more about a recovery and that forward look. Um, I guess looking at that forward look there is no significant changes to our December timetable um, so far as West Yorkshire is concerned, but for a northeastern service, um, we're hoping to introduce a, a six path on, on that route um, at some point between December and May timetable. In terms of our service delivery at the moment, we, we're suffering somewhat um, with the, the COVID lag. Um, when you're in periods of hibernation, you can't train your drivers. And actually, we lost quite a few drivers during our hibernation period. I think everybody knows that we, we as a commercial business, we're, we're not supported like the franchise operators. We take the full sort of revenue risk. That's that's the business that we're in. Um, we're not complaining about it by any means, but we've got to recover from that quickly. Um, the driver training program is going well. Um, and as far as West Yorkshire is concerned, we should see some competent drivers come back online um, later this month, early November. We have had uh, a little bit of service delivery bank because of the driver numbers. Um, but like I say, we're, we're working through that at pace. Um, but these things can take time. In terms of our onboard proposition, um, we reduced our headcount on board our train. Um, but like I say, with the passenger numbers that we've got at the moment, um, we'll need to build back on that. Um, and that's what we're actively working on just now. So I guess the bottom line for us is 
is that we are um, very, very optimistic of the future. We need to make sure that we are in a viable, safe operation and attract um, our customers to get back to where we were at 2019 levels. And that's about it from me. And thanks for listening. Great. Thanks, Sean. Any any questions for Sean or anything else on, on, on for train operators? I, th I think we've gone through all the train operators. So any any questions? Okay, great. And I am right. We, there isn't anybody else I've missed as they're on trains. We'll move on to buses. If that's okay. Okay. Um, okay, we'll move on to, to bus operators. Just just going around in, on, on my screen, I've got um, Christopher from first. Do you want to go go first? Yeah, I can go first. Uh, at, we, at first, at the moment, we're focusing on retention, as probably my, my colleagues within the bus industry can back me up here we've seen a, a lot of drivers leaving our industry at the moment uh, the government sent out letters for people to go back to hgv driving and a lot of taken that up uh, we also through the pandemic had a lot of issues with the dvla issuing licenses which has put us with our training program as well quite a long way behind at the moment uh, in Huddersfield, we are just short of 75 percent pre-covid patronage uh, we're trying to encourage this. We've brought the um, £1 fare in after seven o'clock. And also we do have in Halifax, Huddersfield, Leeds, Bradford, we now have on the ground um, colleagues who are there for any questions in the bus stations and around the city centres as well. Um, that's about all from first at the moment in Huddersfield. Uh, okay. Any questions? Can I can I just ask a, a couple of things? Um, yeah, yeah. Just, just firstly, what you were just saying about um, dri the driver issue, because is is it the case that drivers are leaving to go to HGV just because I, I'm not, I'm not expert, but do, do those do those licenses overlap or or is it that people have dual licenses? Because it's not some, just some easy already to train, have it. it? No, 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 some don't, some normally some come to us from HGV and have their HGV licenses, so go back. The, the, mm. There was a, a link that was telling them where to go, where they'll get a lot more money than what we're paying. Mm. <laughs> is it just do with HGVs or is it a wider issue around driver retention for other other into other roles, you know? Uh, it's, yeah, we, we, we are seeing drivers going to all sorts of different roles. We've had them going to supermarkets to drive for them, everything at the moment. Okay. And to be honest, the other thing that I just wanted to touch on and just ask if you could expand on is obviously you've mentioned about staff shortages and, and I, this doesn't just apply to first before. I think I think it's other other um, uh, operators as well. I've had sort of feedback from people to say bus services are not running smoothly at the moment. Lots of buses don't turn up. Um, it's difficult to plan routes. Some, some particular ones that I've had in my area is the 548 and the 549. And also people raised with me, you know, some of the services that are not um, being made are services that are being subsidised by ta the taxpayer. Yet, you know, so, so where is the value for money for the taxpayer in terms of services that are not being being met? So I just wondered if you could give us a little bit more detail around what's the actual, you know, what 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 is the performance actually at the moment? Um, the, the performance at the moment, we're, we're running just short of ninety percent in Huddersfield of what we're supposed to be doing. Um, Long-term sickness within, I presume, the whole of the bus industry has gone up massively. We seem to be having a lot of on-the-day absences as well. Um, through the pandemic, schemes were put in where drivers could take advantage of making sure they still got paid and things like that. So we did have a lot of on-the-day difficulties. Uh, we don't... We, we When we do have major days of um, driver shortages. We don't take out the services, the, the hourly services and anything like that, but the frequent services that suffer. So we, we don't concentrate on punishing one service. Okay, Sean, I'll bring you in. You got your hand up. Thank you, yeah. Um, I want to, on that, I want to ask about cancellation of the last bus. Because I thought it, that was a no-no in terms of bus operations. You cancelled a 306, the last 306 of the day at 10.25 on a Tuesday night last week or the week before. And I had to get a, I had to get a taxi. Well, I'd have to look into that. 
Sean, I come. This, this is yeah. the happened, and there was about five or six people who turned up for it and ended up getting making alternative arrangements. If it, it, if you want to somehow contact me, Sean, I can look into that and I can find out what happened for you. Okay, well, yeah, we we, we want the buses running. We don't. Well, yeah, it's after the fact now, but yeah. I th what I want to know is what's the, the command authority's attitude to last buses? It used to be you should never never not run the last bus of the day. Um, Paul, Paul, you've got your hand up too. Yeah, so I just wondered if uh, if Chris doesn't mind, I could just just add a little bit of colour to this topic. Um, so. Yeah, as an industry, we try our best to avoid cancelling the last buses. Um, we, we move heaven and earth to try and resource them. Um, it does happen occasionally. So, for example, you could be sat there, the bus will break down. Um, with the best will in the world, you, you can't respond to that. We do have, across West Yorkshire, um, a commitment that we will provide free taxis for any um, anybody who is... Um, let down by the fact that the last bus has been cancelled. Um, so there is a process whereby um, th those customers should be able to claim back any um, any expense on that uh, from the operator to concern. That, that's a, a standard that applies across all operators um, set up as part of the early um, development of the alliance has been in place for uh, three or four years now. So um, I think if everybody's... Um, People aren't aware of that. We probably need to sort of bring that a bit more to the forefront. It was something we put a lot, a lot of time and effort into messaging. Uh, so I think it's 2018 when it came in. Um, it's probably lost a little bit of prominence on there, but that, that is certainly still in place. Um, and in, in the the, the rare event you write, it is a it it is as much as a no no as it can ever be. Uh, I say you can't you can't guarantee a mechanical failure uh, or even sometimes a personal failure might not happen at, at the time when you. You simply cannot resolve it, but this, the approach is always to make sure we find a way of getting people at home at no cost to themselves if they do that, and that applies to to anybody across this uh, the operating uh, groups in uh, in West Yorkshire. Yeah, thanks. Right. For that. Can you say, um, yep. with respect to the, this, the Team Pennine, it wasn't them; it was the first bus, and there was no advertisement whatsoever, any alternative arrangement that could be made by anybody. Thanks, Councillor Bolt. Yeah, thanks, James. Just coming in on the back of that, as as Paul has just alluded to there in his speech, yeah, I think there is a need for uh, greater communication. Um, I had a case to deal with where, and it's being dealt with by Reva, where uh, a lady was left stranded at Pinderfields Hospital. What I'd suggest is, both through WICA managing bus stops and, and things like that, uh, the operators on board adverts and through real-time advertising that we make sure this information is out there. You know, it could be added to bus stops on the uh, the notices within there that in the event of the last bus missing, you are entitled to a taxi home and reclaim the fare. If there is an issue where a service is benefiting from real-time information, can that be uh, pinged onto the RTI boards? So the customers are aware because, as Paul said, it's probably been in for a while. I don't know how effectively it was communicated uh, at first, but certainly for the lady that I was talking to, who waited an hour and a half at Pinderfields. Um, yeah, it's unacceptable. And we need to make sure that if we are encouraging people back onto passenger transport, that when there are glitches in the service, they know that there is a backup. Otherwise, they won't be using it again. Thanks, Joe. Um, Paul, did you put your hand up again? Or that... Yeah, I was just, I was just yeah. going to come with that. My boss at the moment is in the alliance meeting, <laughs> so there's something we need to go. So I've just messaged him to say we need to um, perhaps bit, put a bit more life back into this. And yeah, I think all those points Councillor Bolt has, has raised there yeah. about yeah, it needs to be prominent on the bus stations where you're more likely to catch these things. We will just we will as a as an alliance, the operators and Wicked together, just go back and make sure we are we are reinforcing this. Um, we'll make sure all our all our colleagues uh, fully in the loop. So it is out there, it is live, but so sometimes these things um, do dip out of people's consciousness if they're not uh, not refreshed on there, but it certainly is a, is a live scheme still. Mark, you got your hand up? 
Yeah, just just to reiterate what Paul said. Actually, I will take that back through our customer customer services team. Uh, they recommend, you know, the the, the the observations that it could be better advertised. We could have it on notices. We could have an RTI. I'll take that back as well. It's uh, I wasn't aware of either of these uh, okay. instances, but rest assured, yeah, we'll pick it up. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's useful, and I do fully understand the the, the reasoning behind the the last bus i suppose the problem is if you've yeah. got a general issue with bus services not turning up and you've got to get to work you're going to have to get a taxi too whether it's the last bus or not otherwise you're not going to get there on time so i think you know this wider question about is there a, you know how, how we you know is what is the <laughs> what is the plan you know to, to make sure this this issue around shortages if that's what, what, what drive shortages how is that going to be resolved it sounds like it's there isn't really an easy resolution from what what i'm hearing um I, paul i can bring you back in if you want for any further comments just to, to i can see there's a there's a there's a comment from david as well which um can answer as we go through i suppose which is when are we likely to get back the timetables we had pre pre-covid but i don't know if you wanted to give a, a wider update and, and obviously any comment on that as well yes thank you chair um I, I was i was about to start saying that i think this is my first um kirkley's meeting with these but I think I actually went to one about five years ago in, in Dewsbury Town Hall I think Pete Myers is probably the only person who was there that's uh, uh, that I remember from that one so it's, it's been a little while ago but um, yeah so I'm, I'm from commercial director at Transdev uh, the owners of Team Pennine who are, um, basically bought the business of Yorkshire Tiger back in July um, probably not the best time um, to, to buy a bus company in the middle of a pandemic but we, we thought we'd have a go. Um, so we've um, we've now been running for the best part of four months. Um, we've got um, quite a bit further with our um, investment plan that I think we we initially set out to. So we, we started off with um, being six buses straight in to, to relaunch our um, service into Denbydale for Huddersfield, um, which is under our Denby Darts brand. Um, we've since brought in another seven... Um, Buses for other services that are um, our first Euro six ones in in Kirklees, um, which could start. We've got another five under refurbishment, so we should be about sixty percent of the fleet refreshed by the end of November. Um, a few more to uh, to work on uh, over the winter, but hopefully the, the, the transformation in appearance and standards is uh, um, it's been seen. We got some some good feedback um, from uh, customers from that. Uh, we've also got some new engineering structures in place. Um, our new engineering manager started uh, on Monday, uh, so he's getting his feet on the table. Uh, and that'll help us greatly um, in, in continuing to improve our, our delivery and standards. Um, we are, like other operators, struggling for, for staff. Um, being quite a small operator, so we run 27 buses out of our depot at Waterloo, um, therefore losing a driver uh, actually can be quite um, quite significant. So if we lose a couple in a week, um, it does quite an impact on us. Um, our, our policies would be to try and focus, if we have to drop service on routes where we either got the most frequency or we've got alternate provision in place. Um, so we, we've we've managed to, to still run um, very nearly 100% of our tendered work out of Waterloo. Um, I think we, we've, we've lost a couple of trips to breakdowns, but actually we... We, 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 we try and avoid um, affecting those too much. It, it is quite a challenge at the moment because we are we are all running on on empty um, in terms of stuff numbers, in fact, probably less than empty. And therefore, the the usual things we can do to respond to a um, a driver oversleeping or a driver who's um, taking ill or even is late running, we we sometimes don't don't actually have. That the standby and spare drivers we would normally do, which has led on occasions to routes that we would normally do everything we can to avoid cancelling. Um, we, we've had to, to drop some of those. Again, that that's sort of that, that is reflective across the industry. Um, it is a I think perhaps just to pick up on the question about what is the what are the issues of the driver shortage. Um, there are many many um, different ones. It, it's not one cause. Um, we had at like Pick Myers, there was a spell where driver training was really difficult. Um, in fact, it didn't, didn't happen. Um, we've had um, some industrial disputes at DVLA, which has ca caused a great backlog of um, test processes. We're also having where 
uh, licensed applications need medical checks. So broadly, for anybody over 45, that's taken a, a longer period because clearly um, medics have sometimes perhaps better things to do than necessarily check licensed applications. So, so that, that extends things. It's taken a lot, lot longer to get a driver through training. Um, we've also had um, people who've returned to um, Europe to Europe, who previously worked for us, who've, who've moved back after we, we left the European Union, but others who went back during the pandemic and haven't, may return, but haven't yet. Um, we've had an increased number of people taking retirement who wouldn't often stay on, but perhaps they've they've decided during the, the pandemic, well, actually, do I really need to do to work here? Um, we've had the, the, the haulage uh, industry recruiting well. There's increased home delivery, so there's lots and lots and lots of little, little things that all add up to a big problem. However, this, this is not our first driver shortage in our industry. Um, we, we do come back. It, it will take a while. Um, we are recruiting. There are, there are plenty of people out there wanting to work. It's just hard turning them into drivers. I've got a batch at, at Waterloo, I think, who are probably the best trained drivers we've ever had because um, they're in about their eighth week in the, in the training course we've. We've, we've driven them around every route. They've got comprehensive route knowledge. They, they know the inside and outside of everything. But we've not gotten through a test yet because the test slots are, are delayed. It's things like that that are, that are holding us up. So we will, we will get there. It's not purely about people being tapped up by one, one sector or another. Um, and, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult. It, it's, it's frustrating. Um, and having conversations about which service you're having to cancel today um, is not why we're in this business, but we, we are try, trying our best to, to use the resources we can to deliver as, as good a service. And we, we thank our customers for, for uh, and stakeholders for, for putting up with this um, while, while we can't be as best as we, we normally could. Um, so I think that's just picking up uh, Mr. Pornby's question in the chat. I think um, certainly from our perspective and from a, Team Pennine point of view, we're new here, but we, we do run across the across Bradford Leeds districts um, already and also around the rest of the north of England. We we got back pretty much everything in our patch back to, to pre-COVID um, at the end of August. Um, by the middle of September, some of them have gone back down again because we, the driver shortage kicked in and we had to cut some things back. So I I think the, the intention of the industry nationally is that by um, certainly between January and April next year, we should be back onto a, a, a regular process of, of standardised timetables and things like that and, and registrations. There, uh, there may be things that are done that were done during the last twelve months that become permanent. Um, some of which are positive, some of which are negative. The, the, the world has changed, but the idea is that we will. We will always we will continue to run around the same level of network we, we've always had. There may be bits that are different from it. Um, at the moment, we're probably running about ninety to ninety-two percent across West Yorkshire because of driver availability. Um, so, first thing is we need to get enough people back to get us back to one hundred percent, and then we can we can build that up. But get, going forward, there's I mean over the last. Uh, I think, Jay, you, you mentioned about services that were publicly funded. Since last March, every service has been publicly funded in some measure. Um, so we, we, and as part of that, we've worked extremely well I think with colleagues at Wicker. Um, we've had a really good relationship with them, some open sharing of more data, sharing of more information um, and having conversations we probably wouldn't have had a couple of years ago. So our, our legacy from the our legacy from the crisis is perhaps two things: we've got a fleet of buses that are probably cleaner than they've ever been. So let's let's keep that. People like that. We will keep doing more cleaning, like like Northern has suggested. Uh, and also we keep this relationship going. And actually, what we what we deliver um, next year and beyond is done in a, a planned and perhaps more open way than it may have been in the past. Uh, so hopefully that that reassures that we as soon as we get sufficient drivers will be back to, to where we are in terms of service levels or where we're expected to be. Hopefully that's a sufficient update. Happy for any questions that uh, you may have. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Any, any questions specifically before for Paul before I bring in Dwayne? 
If not, I'll, Dwayne, do you want to, to, to come in and give your update? Uh, yes, certainly can. Um, so I, I think firstly, um, uh, and to reiterate um, the um, sentiment of, of my colleagues, uh, I just want to make an apology to our, our customers. Um, we know that our recent service delivery has not been up to our usual standards. And um, as has been mentioned, we are struggling through a, a driver shortage, no different to most bus companies up and down the country. Um, this is um, it's forcing us to cancel some trips, um, and usually we'd have spare drivers available to cover those um, on the day absences. They're stepping up to um, to cover vacant duties, and so we're less agile than, than we ordinarily would be um, to react to issues of sickness that may emerge on the day. So uh, I just wanted to take the opportunity to um, to thank our customers for for bearing with us, um, and also to inform the committee of the of the actions that we're taking to to get over this uh, this hurdle. Um, as you would expect, we've got an intensive recruitment campaign um, on social media, um, also on the uh, adverts on the back of our buses, um, which you may uh, may have seen. Um, we're working with the DVLA to fast track provisional license applications. So that increases the number of trainees that we, we can have in our school. Um, and we're also temporarily increasing our starter rate for existing PCV license holders um, to a higher rate of pay. Um, and that's just to incentivize people to, to, to come and join us. Um, in terms of our service delivery, as uh, was mentioned by Chris, um, we obviously prioritize our less frequent routes wherever possible. Um, and, um, and then we have Cooper Bridge. Um, so we've got a, a major diversion in place at the moment for our 229 route um, via Murfield, which is a, a, a new area on that, on that route, um, a, a temporary addition. Um, we're doing that because we've had to split our 202 and 203 services into two routes, one running Huddersfield to Bradley, and what, one running Murfield to Leeds. And I should just say, this is only while, whilst Cooper Bridge is closed at the time that it is. Um, and then connectivity between the two destinations is maintained by that diverted 229. Um, and the reason for mentioning this, this is obviously increasing the pressure on our driver resources. The, it's a significant number of additional drivers that we need to accommodate that. Um, and it's come at a time where we can ill afford um, those additional drivers. So um, we recognize the importance of maintaining the connectivity, um, but we are struggling through and it is a, it is a struggle, but, um, you know, thank you for bearing with us. Um, to a more positive note across the network, um, as we recover from the pandemic, um, we're growing week by week. So we're back up to around about 76% within Kirklees of our, our pre-pandemic patronage um, and very strong performance, particularly at weekends as well, uh, which is particularly encouraging as that leisure market um, uh, books the trend and is, is what's carrying us through. Um, we are also investing in Kirklees. Um, so since we last spoke at this committee, we've launched our Sapphire buses, um, state-of-the-art Sapphire buses on our, our direct Huddersfield to Leeds service, the 229, and our Huddersfield to Wakefield services, the 231 and 232 as well. Um, and customers on, on there will benefit from free Wi-Fi, USB charging points, comfy e-leather seats, um, and next stop audio announcements and display screens. Um, the good news as well, these buses are Euro 6, so the very latest standard in exhaust emissions, um, so um, uh, much more environmentally friendly. Um, and for our other buses, we're partway through a fleet refurbishment program. Um, so our 228, 261 and 271 customers will benefit from the first batch of vehicles to receive a makeover. Um, and customers of the 126 and 127 will be next to see improvements as well. Um, finally, in terms of ticketing. Um, so um, obviously, we're going back um, to work in a, in a different way, some of us um, and um, flexible working, working from home, etc. Um, we've introduced a new 12-day um, bundle ticket on our mobile app, which is proving quite popular. Um, so this is an alternative to the tr traditional weekly ticket, um, because we know not everyone is back at work each day of the week. So that 12-day bundle allows um, travel for 12 days, um, but those 12 days obviously don't all need to be continuous. And we've introduced that at uh, £44, which is less than £3.70 a day. So that's, um, it, it gives the same incentive um, to uh, travel more frequently with us, but we recognise that doesn't have to obviously be continuous. Um, that's the update for Aruba Yorkshire. Happy to take any questions. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dwayne. So any questions for Dwayne or any wider questions or comments on, on bus operations? No, we're happy with, we're happy with that. We've had a... Uh, had a lot on that discussion. Okay, that's fine. So th thank you for all those uh, contributions on that. Um, okay, so we'll move on to the um, final item um, on the workshop workshop session. Um, Mark, do you, shall I hand over to you to, to lead on that? Yep, thank you. 
so I'm, I'll sh- I've got a presentation uh, to share. Just bear with me a moment. I'm not a great expert on um, Zoom, but I shall give that this a try. Tell me if this appears okay, please. Yes, it has appeared. We got it. It's, it's not in a. I don't know if you can put it into a slideshow. No. Oh, okay. Bear with me. I'm sure I can. Yeah. Is that any better? Um. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. uh, I mean, we can see it. It's just it's not in. We can see all that. We can see the um surrounding stuff as well we can't just see oh. it in big but i mean it's okay we can f- i think f- i can see f5 it. f5 bear with me nope that's not playing any better no nope. no 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 I mean, I, I can I can read it if everyone can, else is okay with that. Can people read that? I can you see. I mean, I yeah, we, we can see it. It's, yeah. Okay, I'll make the i make the screen a little bit too far. <laughs> yeah, that's fine like that. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, right, apologies for that. Um, so, this is just to get your um, feedback from from um, colleagues, uh, public representatives. Um, uh, council representatives, that uh, member representatives, on how we move forward. Obviously, we've been through a really challenging time uh, with COVID. Um, I'll go through a few slides that sort of sets the context, which we've already heard quite quite eloquently from from operator colleagues on what the issues we've had and what we've we've been. And but this is an opportunity to ask you how you feel we could probably make move things forward. What do you, as users, feel have been the impacts? Um, and what can we do to sort of move forward from some sort of potentially quite significant changes to how we, we commute, how we shop, how we use public transport and what makes it important to us. Um, so at the end, I'd like to have a bit of an open forum and we would just gather your thoughts on the three questions there. Uh, how has COVID changed your travel habits? Um, what needs to happen to enable transport to support an economically sustainable recovery? So how do we get back to where we've got a really good public transport network that supports the users. Um, and how do we make sure that we get as many people using it, get it really, get public transport back uh, where it's accessible and um, attractive to everyone really. Um, so just to set a bit of context, they're really they're a bit busy these slides for me, um, potentially for yourselves, but the two on the right hand side, show generally the, the position that we're in. Um, obviously, bus travel and train travel are down. I, I think we've sl- heard slightly more encouraging figures today um, from colleagues at the operators than what we've got there, which is 70% of bus at the moment and 60% of rail, um, but also slightly discouraging car is recovering much more quickly at uh, 87%. Uh, and we know what the reasons for that, I think, I think it's, it's fairly, um, it's fairly common knowledge and we can also see a logic for why that is. Um, but a thing I'd like you to just digest probably a little bit more on, on this next slide. And this is really about how we look, how we look forward. So there's a little block on the left there that says people in the future do expect to commute significantly less. I think we can all recognize that. We probably intend to do more uh, shopping online uh, and use more, more online activities. Um, and according to this particular study um, on, on future travel, the impact does seem to be uh, on public transport. So there is a, 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 a forecast decline in the use of public transport. Unfortunately, that's not translated into, tra- into cars where there's a, a minor, quite small, but nevertheless significant from our perspective, increasing in potentially in car travel. Um, there is some encouraging signs on active travel, these are all really positive, these, these bits over here. Um, so people do intend, are, are using more active travel, walking and cycling, and intend to do so. So there's been some, some really positive aspects from that perspective come out, of, um, come out of it. But I think it's the bit in the middle that I think we are all sort of marginally concerned with. 
uh, in that it does intent does look like people are not as com- not as interested in going back on public transport as they may be of getting in the cars. Um, that's specifically when well, we talked about online shopping, um, travel to commute is a big one um, across the board. Again, it's a busy slide. This, but in effect, it's what it's saying is there will be a lot less commuting across all modes. Um, but the biggest impacts again do appear to be on on public transport and what do we do to try and change that trend and and for all the good reasons of um, less cars on the road, carbon mitigation, air quality, all that sort of business, how do we sort of change that perception uh, of people and and what what are your views on that and what what can we what can we do on that? Um, so just a quick summary there uh, of what's how we've got to road is recovering more more effectively. Um, while people who've used public transport uh, have been comfortable doing so, the non-users uh, are still very nervous, uh, and there's the 42 and 47 uh, percent of, of potential users. These are people who've not come back to any form of public transport yet, are still concerned about social distancing, face coverings, and things of that nature. Um, so there are a few way, different ways of, of, of dealing with that. Um, moving on to a number of issues that have been discussed today uh, from a from a, a wicker perspective. Obviously, we've we've got the uh, MCARD mobile app, and that gives a lot more flexibility and a lot more accessibility. Um, it's as as Paul and the other operators have suggested. There's, there are lots of other options for flexibility that's been brought through a number of different channels, um, and this is a Again, using the, the M card, which is a, um, yeah, a multimodal ticket, that's really important for people. I think that's a, a really important part of the, of the recovery uh, and increased flexibility to help with that changes in commuting patterns, particularly. Um, there are similar things on, on rail. Um, so that, again, recognizing that people's habits have, cha- have changed and will continue to change. Um, and there are a number of products there that, are, that, we're, we're, that we're looking at. Um, the green aspect. I mean, this is in everyone's everyone's mind now. Um, you know, we with COP26 coming up, it's really important that we do look at the the, the green campaign and use that as a, a really important um, element of getting people back to public transport. Um, you know, we know that buses and trains make significant reductions in in uh, in car usage, uh, and we need to use that and use that that impetus that there is in in society at the moment to do something about. Uh, about um, carbon reduction and uh, improved air quality and things of that nature. Uh, and then let's build on the trend of the active travel side of things. Um, it, it, is a, it is a fact that people have got more in touch with, with active travel, walking and cycling during the pandemic. Um, we wouldn't want to lose that with increased car usage. I think one of the things that has that, that was a, a benefit to people is that there were less cars around while they were able to cycle and walk, which made it a much more pleasant from an air quality perspective and a much more safe um, pers- uh, safe environment to work in. So how do we work on that? And there are a number of things we can do around improving that, that side of things. And I know there have been a number of discussions earlier about that. Um, and then a bit more on active travel there about trying to um, improve routes and, and get all that sort of really in the in the psyche. So that's a quick run through. Uh, we know things have changed over COVID. We've not recovered as yet. Um, what we need to address is people's perceptions going forward, and what are those societal changes that we that we've uh, that we can see and, and are potentially going to appear. And um, and what are your thoughts, really, please? Anything we, we've obviously got some thoughts. We've got a bus service improvement plan that we want to bring bring forward, and various other things. But this is an opportunity f- for you to give us your hands-on experience, if possible, please. Uh, and we'll record, obviously, um, feed in anything that you say under these three headings. Uh, I'll just read them out, but just come in and any any observations you need to you want to make or thoughts or anything of that nature then obviously we'll record them and take them back and feed them into into the future planning um so the questions were uh how has covid changed your travel habits and perception of safety what needs to happen to enable transport to support an economically sustainable recovery um and that that probably references the shopping and, and commuting reduction and how do we ensure transport options enable the widest range of people to be included in society so um 
I don't know if you want to manage the, the, the questions, Chair, or whether you want me to just, uh, yeah. I'll just let people. That's fine, yeah. If people want to comment, obviously put your hand up or, or comment in, in, in the chat box. Uh, Martin, I can see you've got your hand up. You can go first. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, how do we ensure transport options enable the widest range of people? Um, one issue where I don't think that WICA press enough um, is, and you, you'll get this shortly in, in your ward, James, is on planning applications. Where you get larger planning applications, there's often uh, a request for contribution from developers towards M cards. The number of times I've seen that, you know, we had, uh, well, we've got one in um, in Murfield on the opposite side of the River Calder from the railway station. And, and the request is for a, a, a bus only M card. Um, I don't think there's very many buses go from Lower Hopton to Leeds and places like that for commuters. Um, there was one in Hanging Eaton last week, 55 houses, you know, bus only M card. If, if we're going to get money from developers and we're going to encourage modal shift, then WICA should be asking for um, all mode M cards because in those cases, you know, people uh, can integrate, go on a bus and then on the rail for part of the journey. So let's be a bit bolder with that. Um, but both for, for points two and three, in the respect of active travel, we need to get a grip of having a proper um, network planned so that we can figure out what's, what's on the ground and what have we got coming up that we're going to uh, we're going to deliver and prioritise those. We've speaking from a Kirklees perspective, we've got numerous disconnected bits of infrastructure, um, and where the infrastructure isn't connected, it's putting users uh, back onto the roads. So we need to be looking at uh, making sure we have a continuous, safe environment. Um, the other thing where Wyker and in this case Kirklees again need to be stronger and work together is with things like the trans Route upgrade um, coming towards uh, your wards, James, where you come down the Calder Valley Greenway, you come across the Bradley Viaduct and there's a, a small bridge over the railway as it comes to Bradley Industrial Estate, which is going to be demolished. Network Rail at the moment haven't been able to, to say um, how long they will be demolishing and then rebuilding. So how long is the greenway going to be out of action? If the users can't access the greenway, the option is to put them back onto the A62, uh, which from there means probably going around Cooper Bridge, one of the big, busiest intersections. And as we know, coming up for more and more works. So what Wyker and Kirkley should be doing is turning around to network rail. And we, we had mentioned of TRU earlier, but there was no update on the trans route um, hearing. It's going to a public hearing, isn't it, a review? Where Network Rail are splitting our active travel corridors, then they should be putting in place suitable diversions. The Bradley one, James, you, there is a link that drops them down onto a fairly wide canal towpath that goes to Ashgrove Road near Syngenta. If that was surfaced and the cost of doing so against TRU is minimal, then the, the, the users will be able to get back onto Leeds Road by Syngenta and continue the journey. We're not then um, disaffecting and making it more dangerous for people. So, yeah, let's really push the, um, the carbon reduction agenda that we want. Let's look at um, the schemes that we're talking about. And obviously, there's been much mentioned in Kirklees about the A629 chopping trees down yeah we ought to be looking when major schemes are coming through wica for uh, a full carbon evaluation yeah what's it what does it actually mean to people in the long term but yeah the, the message i think is let's be bold and developers network rail and people like that should be paying for the disruption okay thank you thank you martin does anybody else have any their hands up, I can't, I can't see anybody, but if, if not, um, while, while people think, I, the only things I was going to add, um, Mark, on this, just, just on active travel, um, I'm quite conscious just, just thinking about this, that everybody who's at this meeting is a man, I think. Um, and one of the things that I've certainly in terms of things like um, walking routes, etc., 
is about safe, safety aspects, particularly particularly for 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 women, um, in light of recent events as well. Um, and I think that is a question mark around safety. Um, do people feel you know some of these some of these kind of things can be quite secluded? Um, and I, I guess it's how you can make sure they're light, the the, the brightly lit. Um, people feel safe using them, particularly I guess in winter months. Um, I think obviously that feeds into what the mayor's doing in terms of her, her thoughts on on women and, and girls. So I, I think that's probably something that we should probably look for some thoughts thoughts on um, as part of this. Um, and then the other thought I just just had from from feedback I've had is just around that cross. Uh, Martin sort of referred to it, but the kind of cross um, the cross the cross sort of, um the cross mode ticketing so i think the m card and, and and the feedback i've got is you know that the, the daily m card is is fine but it's quite expensive particularly if you're doing a journey like you know train to the bus station bus station um so train a uh, bus to a uh, bus to the train station and train somewhere else it's quite possible that journey journey is actually cheaper than your, what your m card would be and i think it's quite complicated for people to actually know that sometimes there's no option that just says to people I want to go here. What's my cheapest option? Um, we heard from from operators about different initiatives that had been put in place to try and you know encourage customers back, which is great. But that probably just potentially adds even more confusion to people as to what the best options for them for them are in terms of um, you know value for money. Yeah. So I just put that in. Um, Sean, you've got your hand up. Would you like to come in? Don't know if you're on mute, we can't, we can't hear you. Nope. Sean, are you there? We, we can't see your hand up, we can't hear you. There we go. Yeah, sorry, I'm here. Um, <laughs> sorry. When, um, when there was developing the M card, we were promised there was going to be a lot more regional local tickets, like Huddersfield only or something. And it's, it, that's not ever developed. It seems once they converted all the paper tickets to plastic tickets, that's where the system stopped to be developed. And I wonder why that happened. Okay. I, I don't know. Probably, as you say, it's the, the ticketing company has been operating for quite some time, so I don't know just what's happened to that. But these are all really valid points, um, and that is the, the purpose of this forum. Um, so they'll all be captured and they'll all be fed back into the appropriate uh, um, appropriate teams to to be discussed and, and, and get some feedback to you. Mark, uh, do you want to come in? Good afternoon. I, I, uh, I was just thinking, really, when it comes to wanting to get more people to use public transport, you've got to make it easy. The car is the easy option for everyone, if you've got a car, obviously. I know lots of people don't have cars, but you do need to make it easy for people. And if you've got situations where some train stations, for instance, have only uh, hourly services during the day, people are going to choose to go by car, potentially, um, rather than take a bus, which could be rather more expensive and certainly take a, a lot longer. For example, if you, I live in Slough and we have an hourly train service during the day. Um, our buses are more frequent, but they're uh, considerably more expensive and they take considerably longer. So things like having a half hourly train service would be a, a great boost to stations like Slough and Marston. And I don't know what the situation is on the other side of Huddersfield, but I'm sure Councillor Bolt would inform us, but I'm sure Deaton and stations heading out towards Dewsbury, it is probably a similar situation. Um, and uh, also, if you're wanting to include the widest range of people to be able to get onto a train, you need to have access for people with physical disabilities. Marston and Slawick, for instance, have very, very poor access. You cannot get a wheelchair on or off at Marston Station unless you're willing to effectively crawl up a lot of stairs, which is just appalling. 
at Slawick, you can get off at one side, but not get on at the other because you have to come up a coupled road. So there's things like that that really need to be looked at. And apologies, I missed the start of this uh, uh, this session because uh, I was unable to get on. Uh, but things like the Trans Pennine route upgrade and uh, all the railway works that people are discussing, I don't know if it was discussed earlier, but we really would benefit, I think, from having somebody from Network Rail on to try and give us some information about all these things, because we're talking about it in isolation. And it does seem to go round in circles a little bit without us actually uh, getting information from the people that are either making the decisions or certainly tasked with communicating them. That's all really I'd like to say, thanks. Thank you, and I think the um, on, on the access to the, to, the, to the stations as well, this is something that we obviously discussed before, and I think, it, you know, part of this, it, it, you know, does obviously as well impact, like, on, like you say, on those decisions around what what network rail are doing on the trans pan upgrade and because initially those potentially were going to be captured as part of those works now doesn't look like they are and what are the alternatives and i know mac we have that has been fed back at this meeting before and we've been given various kind of um answers around well we'll try to find other sources of funding um and things like that but i, I don't think we've ever really you know we've obviously never got to a, a clear resolution on it um, so I think that is something that we should we should take back again. Um, just looking at what David had said said in the chat, he says, um, "Give bus travel priority over car travel. Provide a reliable and punctual bus service. Have different zones across uh, West Yorkshire regarding usage." Um, so I, th I think those are. I think it'd be interesting to know that as well in, in terms of the M card because there there are there are zones out there on the M card, but I don't know that the oh, zones yeah. are. Is this a, although there are, although there are zones are the tickets just based on leads or not leads? Is that is that basically the the tick, the way that the ticket works? No, there are five five zones, uh, and it does start in the centre. So it's zone one is city, is city centre, um, mm -hmm. and zone two is greater leads, uh, and then three, four, and five move move out in sort of right to the boundaries of the of the region. So Steeton and Silsden in the north and Marsden in the west, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there are various various zones and you cool. can buy tickets for various zones, but whether it's got the full flexibility that people people want, which goes back mm. to, um, I think, was Sean's point about having um, maybe district-centred tickets would be quite yeah, it's, it's, it's a valid point. It sounds to me, like I said, I don't know 100%, but it sounds to me like from what Sean said, it needs to be, we need to look at it more than just a working outward from Leeds. Yeah. To, to those to those centres yeah. that, that yeah. you know and, you know we don't want to just we need to make sure that it works for those yeah. local localities. Um, so I can just say my because at the moment all you get if you want a, a local ticket you've got to go to a specific operator, yeah. which means it restricts which particularly restricts the minor operators where you might take a minor operator into the other bus station then a major operator. That's where where I'm coming from. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, uh, Martin. Yeah, just picking up on the point about Marsden Station. Yeah, as I say it has been it's been raised, and as as indeed I have raised Murfield on just about every opportunity we've had on places. Um, probably not for this item, but if I could request James at a future meeting, um, and echo the the thoughts that we should have Network Rail here because they're a key player in this. That um, we have a, a station access item for every station in Kirklees. Um, look at the issues there because uh, yeah, I'm sure there are issues and there, I believe there is an access for all budget. So if we look at station condition, but get a briefing on what grants both locally, regionally and nationally might be available. And again, it fe feeds back into the potential that can we include um, railway stations in any developer contribution, section 106 contribution or anything, because yeah, I'm sure developers will lean towards telling people that they can use public transport rather than make a contribution towards highways improvement. But as we as we know, it falls down when um, when the the transport terminal uh, is below standard. So, pro something for a future item. I'd request James. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to have that as a as an item on the agenda. So, Mark, I don't if that's something we can take away to look at for the for the next next meeting to see if we can have. Um, I can certainly inquire and see if we that. can. Yeah, see if we can get a transparent uh, and rail um, 
representative. I can certainly raise it with Richard Crabtree, our our rail uh, coordinator. I think if we if we have it as a specific item for them to uh, contribute to, um, you know, as as opposed to just or just come along, I, th I think if we had a particular particular item to look at that, it would be would be useful. Um, just on that point, um, there was just put into the chat about future meetings, what, what the date of that meeting is. And I, I don't know whether that's been agreed yet and whether there's still a, a discussion around whether that meeting has to be is in public or in um, online. Is, is that still to be determined at this stage? Um, as the minute chair, that is to be determined, but the date of the meeting is the 23rd of March. Okay. And can I just ask on that, is there actually, other than not being able to approve the minutes, is there actually any um, thing that holds us back from having online meetings? Because we're, we're not formally really taking any specific decisions, are we? Um, I'd have to check the constitution, but I don't believe so. Okay. It's just good to hear what people's thoughts are on that. I, I know before when we, we discussed this last time, I think people were... In, people said that they were in favor of having a having a um online um meeting but i don't know whether that was just because of the cut the covid position or just it's easier for people to, to to access um a bit of both i think uh, chair yeah. they obviously we're hearing on the news today that considerations towards health and things like that are going forward mm -hmm. i mean yeah we're a long way off our next meeting yeah but um and yeah for something like this with dragging a lot of uh, representatives from um, providers. Yeah. Our mm -hmm. environmental agenda suggests that we, we shouldn't all be traveling if we don't need to for uh, what will be a two hour meeting or something. But mm -hmm. uh, if we were in a position where we were making a decision, then as you've alluded to, we'd have to be in the same room. Yeah. Um, I suppose they are the, our minutes will be approved by the transport committee in due course. So, you know, we're a, an advisory body at the moment, aren't we? Not decision making. Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. We'll take we'll take that away and just see see what the um you know what the view is on on, on how we how we take those those five. But I'll take back those opinions that people have, have raised on that. Um. So I think we're coming up to time. I think I think we've probably covered all of the stuff on the um. Or had had people have had opportunity to comment on those those questions is there any other other business that anybody uh, wants to raise at the meeting no okay can i just uh, raise the fact yes, that yes. if you're going to look at reviewing the number of railway stations across uh, west yorkshire that part of that needs a, a full meeting um, you can't really give it justice uh, within 15, 20 minutes. You, you know, if you're going to do a proper review of all the stations and access and how they could be improved and what money is available and, and safety, et cetera, it, it needs a proper, it needs to be given time. Mm. We'll look into that. I think probably what 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 we would need for, to discuss that is a, is a report that's providing us with that that information um as opposed to a meeting to you know discuss what, right. what what's needed I, I think we need I, I think we know i think the combat authority and, and others know what what's needed because it's been fed back a, a number of times i think what we need is a understanding on what how that's being going to be delivered um I, I think that's that's what it is um obviously we can have a debate on it but i, I think that's what we're asking for really is we can talk about it but we kind of know what what's needed don't we? we we need to understand how that can be delivered and if um and if we need to um you know um yeah engage with the people to actually take to get that that happening we need to know what we need to what, what we need to do rather than just kind of have the discussion every every few months um so yeah just i, I take the point it's a long a potentially a detailed item yeah just yeah. picking up sorry james just to clarify it's not all the stations in west yorkshire we'd just be dealing with the stations in clucky in uh, in kirkley yeah, yeah, yeah we would yeah 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 yeah, but, yeah absolutely. But, but we've got to take into account we uh, now west yorkshire mayoral authority and and that does have some implications and people from kirkley's do travel across west yorkshire so you know if you're looking at in kirkley's it needs to be done across consistently across the area 
Yeah. But we, uh, we are the, so we're the Kirklees district. Uh, yes, I accept, I accept that, Martin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I do. I, I take the point, though, that if you get on a train in, in Kirklees and you're going to Wakefield, <laughs> yeah. it's not helpful if you carry yeah. off at the other end, is it? It, yeah, it no. works all, in, all, in all directions. Yeah. So yeah. it has to be. Yeah, there is a certainly, a, you know, it's probably even wider than West Yorkshire, isn't it? Um, in terms of making <laughs> yes, sure that works. Yeah. If you come to Murfield, you can get off a train in London. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> I hope I don't catch it by mistake then. <laughs> Murf- Murfield International Station. Indeed. It's now known. Yeah. <laughs> Forever such. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks everyone uh, for your attendance. A really productive yeah. meeting. Um, and we'll we'll all speak speak next time. Thanks. Thanks so Thank much. You, James. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye.